Well, Donovan, I understand Mount Rainier National Park is open now. That's what I hear. Good news. Yes, it's very good news. Quite a bit of snow up there still. I was on the uh, Paul Peak Trail last weekend, which is on the northwest corner. That, that area has been open. So you, you could still hike in and around the park without going to the major visitor centers. But it's nice to have them open. I imagine it'll be a while for sunrise, so. <laughs> yes. Okay, we, we're up to 765. Great. Thank you all. It's still, it's still uh, adding on, so. But I'm going to go ahead and start at 705. We're, So, whoop, we're now up to 70. And let's, I will begin. First of all, um, welcome tonight, all of you out there. Um, my name is Cheryl Wagner, and I'm the Eastside Chair for um, Central Washington Native Plant Society. And I'm excited to welcome back Donovan Tracy. Last time he spoke to us about the alpine flowers of Mount Rainier. Donovan is an amateur photographer with a special interest in wildflowers photography. He volunteers with UW Herbarium and has co-written with David Giblin, the uh, wildflower guide, Alpine Flowers of Mount Rainier. He also has developed and maintains a website you can check out called Flowers of Mount Rainier. Tonight, he is going to present a photographic essay of the anemone occidentalis, fondly known as the mop head. So Donovan, without further ado, I'll let you take it away and I'm going to disappear. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. I think we're all supposed to disappear here. Okay, I will go ahead and disappear you. There you go. Great, great. Can we get rid of that bar at the top? You know, uh, where it says stop share. Sorry, that's a function that I'm afraid we're stuck with tonight. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us. And Cheryl, thank you for that nice, uh, nice introduction. As, as she mentioned, I am the co-author of this guide, uh, Alpine Flowers of Mount Rainier with David Giblin, the uh, collection manager of the, uh, of the UW Herbarium. Uh, I should mention that um, I do volunteer for the herbarium and uh, I'm not representing the herbarium or the Burke Museum, so all these comments and observations you're going to hear tonight are solely my own. So, the mop heads of Mount Rainier, uh, a photographic study of an enemy occident occidentalist. So, what is a photographic study, and why would we do a photographic study of this particular plant, uh, which is very abundant and, uh, and very common? So uh, let's turn to this guy, uh, Arthur Kuchenberg, who we lost a couple of years ago, Professor Emeritus of Botany at the UW and the founder of the Native Plant Society. Art was the author of this Wildflower Hikes book, mm. and he wrote some notes uh, throughout the book that emphasized certain areas. And you can see it's an interesting cover, isn't it? And he said on, uh, on the note regarding the POS flower, he said, by fall, all the wildflowers have gone to seed and are not very showy, except Western house flower, the anemone occidentalis. Its large creamy white flowers and alpine spring turn into the most bizarre feathered mop of plum seeds. No wonder its other common name is towhead baby. One nature writer, Dan Matthews, says of it, it looks like something Dr. Zeus would have dreamed up. Or more traditionally, it answers to the epithet, the old man of the mountains. All one 
such feathery mop needs as a pair of glassy eyes to look like the toe head of an old man. In fact, I saw just such a plant so decorated by an inspired hiker a few years ago. Well, I think Art would be pleased that there are still a few inspired hikers around. <laughs> the mop head uh, does really capture our curiosity and is a uh, is kind of affectionately known by other names in the family, such as mop top, mouse on a stick, hippie on a stick, fluff puffs, and my favorite, toehead babies. Uh, I've recently heard another name uh, been used called nature's Q-tip, which um, I don't like very well. Uh, I think it's a little demeaning. But here's the plant we're talking about, of course, the anemone occidentalis. Anemone is uh, Greek for uh, an animus uh, or wind, so it's known as the wind flower. Occidentalis is Latin, and it stands for west, a western or of the west. So we should refer to this plant as the western pos flower. Pos is uh, an old French name for Easter. Uh, let's take a quick look at some of the other anemones in Washington's flora, of which there are nine of uh, those, those five shown in red, uh, do occur in Mount Rainier National Park, and we'll take a look at those in a minute. But let's just make a couple comments on some of the others. The first being, the, the only real blue one, I think, is the uh, Oregon anemone. And its range is uh, in low, low to middle, uh, mid elevations primarily. Uh, east of the Cascades, that photo you just saw was taken in Cleellum, and of course some along uh, the coast. Uh, this plant is called the Piper's Anemone. Um, it's courtesy of my good friend Ron, who's taken a lot of a lot of photographs in the eastern and southeastern north uh, northeastern uh, Oregon. Uh, this plant has a range which is really concentrated in the southeast corner of the, of the uh, state. I'm gonna to try to click on this stop share. Am I gonna run into trouble, Cheryl? I did. You're gonna lose, you've lost your presentation. Timothy McDonough is, is reporting that he can't see the presentation. So while you're doing this, could you okay, please I'm chat sure. if you can see the state of Washington on your screen? All right, very good, thank you. Thank you, Jan Burke. Okay, then I get this pop down. I guess that happens every time more people come in. Is that right? Uh, I'm not sure what you're seeing, Donovan. I'm seeing another pop, another screen that drops down from the top. Okay. So the uh, Piper's anemone is uh, collected largely in the southeast corner uh, of the state. Each one of these green dots, by the way, is a collection that is, uh, is held in the UW herbarium. So this, there's actually a specimen sheet. So what we have down here in the southeast, of course, is Lewis and Clark country. And so this plant was collected by Lewis and Clark, but it was collected over in the Lolo Forest uh, near their camp uh, on El Dorado Creek and, uh, and Lunch Creek. And I take that from the uh, Plants of the Lewis and Clark Expedition by Wayne Phillips. So that's for you Lewis and Clark buffs. This is an interesting plant and it is really called the Poss Flower, not the Western Poss Flower. Uh, sometimes uh, referred to as uh, prairie crocus. Richard Ramston uh, provided this photo to the UW uh, herbarium image collection. Now this shares a couple interesting things with uh, anemone occidentalis. Uh, they are the two species where their styles are plumus. And it's interesting that the treatment here in the new flora for anemone is showing it in fruit. And I asked David Giblin, I said, well, like roughly how, how many of the treatments in the, in the flora are shown in fruit? It's just kind of unusual. He says, no, not really, probably around 30% of, uh, 
of the uh, descriptions are in fruit. So you wouldn't want to haul that up to uh, the mountain in the middle of the summer thinking you were going to use it to identify uh, these anemones in, in bloom. But plumus stands for uh, feathery with hairs or flying bristles on both sides of the main axis. Are we, seeing a, are we seeing a box on the right side now? Or just me? No box. Just okay. you. I, I see something that says connecting to audio. Yeah, I have that too. Okay, of, the, uh, of our two anemones with styles that are plumous, uh, the the patents, the styles are spreading, as you can see off on the left. And of course, with the Occidentalists, they're reflexed, where they, they grow and then they, they droop down. So as an example of styles spreading, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a really good picture in the image collection, so I used this one, which I took, which is of this plant, which I'm calling Tracy Iardia. So it's one I have in my yard. Now, it's not native. I don't, I'm not quite sure what it is. I put it in a number of years ago, and it just thrives in this location, which is kind of this sandy, rocky area. So if, if anyone is familiar with these garden varieties of anemones, uh, please shoot me an email. I like, I've never been able to find it again in a nursery, but I like it a lot. Now, our plant, uh, an enemy occidentalis, is found in the herbarium, uh, and the green dots here represent collections uh, that were made in, in herbarium sheets uh, are contained in, uh, in the herbarium. And the most recent collection is right here at the Canadian border, and it's by uh, Native Plant Society fellow Pam uh, Camp, who collected it on July 12th at Slate Pass. And I believe Slate Plat Pass is the highest place in the uh, state that you can drive to. I think uh, sunrise at Mount Rainier is the second highest. Now, it wouldn't surprise us really that the oldest collection uh, in the herbarium is in Mount Rainier uh, National Park. And here's the sheet uh, on that. Uh, the standard herbarium sheet is 11 and a half by 16 and a half. So you can see when it's in seed, uh, the collection shown here is well well, well higher than the 16 and a half. Now what makes this kind of interesting is the date, uh, August 13th, 1888. And this was collected by C.V. Piper, Charles Vancouver Piper. And I like to think of him as uh, Washington's first homegrown academic botanist. So while he was born in Victoria, uh, his parents lived there briefly, he grew up in Seattle, and he attended the, uh, the Washington Territorial uh, University, where he uh, received his Bachelor's of Science degree at age 18 in 1885. Uh, earlier, he, at an early age, joined the, at 16 years old, he was president of the Young Naturalist Society, which is a group of youth that studied the flora and fauna of Western Washington. He began bringing uh, plants home when he was uh, 10 years old. So he was been an avid collector uh, for quite some time. In 1885, he did receive his bachelor's degree. And in 1888, John Muir uh, came to Washington State as part of a, a project he was working on. It's really a book called uh, Cal Picturesque California, the Rocky Slopes, the Rocky Mountains and the Slopes of the Pacific. And he was, formed an expedition to, uh, uh, to visit Mount Rainier and to uh, climb the summit of Mount Rainier. And his party included uh, uh, a photographer, Arthur Churchill uh, Warner, uh, Edward uh, Sturgis Ingram uh, kind of led the expedition and put it together. Somehow, um, Piper and his friend uh, Norman Booth Piper was 21 years old at the time, got themselves invited along on, on this expedition. So 
uh, Piper uh, and Booth uh, joined the party and this whole account I'm taking uh, largely from this book by Aubrey Haynes, Mountain Fever, Historic Conquests of Rainier, which documents the, uh, the early summit attempts. And uh, interesting, um, this was out of print uh, when I tried to get it and I ordered it a secondhand book and about a month later it came in this funny package and I opened it up and it was, it was like new and it came from a bookstore in Ireland. But they, uh, they left Seattle on August 8th, took a train to Tacoma and then 20 miles to Yelm. Booth didn't make the train. Uh, he, he came the next day on another one. On, on the 9th, they packed horses, crossed the Squally River. By the 11th, they got to Longmire, which was then called uh, Longmire Springs or Soda Springs, on to Paradise Valley uh, on the 12th. And on the evening of the 12th, I like to think of this as the evening of the 12th, uh, they reached this site. Uh, and uh, you can see there's, it's, it's full of, uh, this meadow is full of anemones. At this point, Mir makes, makes this following, you know, following state. I, I imagine this, this picture could have been taken on the 13th, but he made this statement on the 12th. And I kind of imagine them sort of late in the day, you know, looking at the mountain. And he says, out of the forest at last, at last there stood the mountain fully unveiled, awful in bulk and majesty, filling all the view like a separate newborn world, yet with all so fine and so beautiful and might well fire the dullest observer to desperate enthusiasm. Long we gazed in silent admiration, buried in tall daisies and anemones by the side of the snowbank. The next day, was the 13th, uh, the morning of the 13th. Um, this photo was taken by A.C. Warner. It's not part of the University of Washington special collection. It's part of the John Muir photographs. And from uh, it, it shows part of the party down on the left-hand side with Indian Henry, who's one of the guides, uh, John Muir, uh, Alumas, who was kind of a publisher, uh, Van Trump, Bill Lehman Van Trump, who was actually leading the summit attempt and had summited twice before, Ingram, uh, William Keith, who was an artist and friend of uh, Mears, who was along to do sketches, and Norman Booth. This area is not referred to as Camp of the Clouds these days, it's Alta Vista. And this is taken right uh, on the Alta Vista Trail on August 1st of 2018. It's kind of interesting, I'll fade back to the, uh, to the historic photo, but you'll see Anvil Rock here, this little cluster of firs you'll see, and then this kind of ridge, so it's kind of interesting, kind of interesting to compare them. Now, Piper was not in this photo because he was off busy collecting. And so prior to their departure of Camp of the Clouds at two in the afternoon, not sure why they left so late, uh, Piper made uh, the following, uh, following collections uh, on, the, on the 13th. So there were, were 49 specimens that he managed to collect uh, before leaving camp. All of these are contained in, in the UW uh, herbarium. Uh, and so he may have collected more, but these are the ones that survived, were mounted, and exist to this day. So that morning, you know, it was filled with botanizing, sketching, picture taking. Warner took a number of pictures, preparation for the ascent. And five and a half hours later, uh, they arrived at Cowitz Cleaver at 10,100 feet, which is now called Camp Muir. Ingram uh, called it Camp Muir at, at uh, a later date. Uh, by the way, of those two, of those 45 specimens, you know, of course, these two, uh, these two sheets were, were included. Piper later on uh, wrote a flora of Mount Rainier that was published in April of 1901 in the Oregon Mountaineers magazine, which is called Mazama. And it was, it was a, it was a flora that basically was a list and then maybe a short description and, and here's how he described uh, the anemone occidentalist. He said, flower large, 
white or bluish, developing a large head of tailed carpels, which has much the appearance of a hussar's cap. Uh, too bad he didn't say mop heads. That would have been kind of fun. A hussar's cap is some kind of a military, you know, some kind of a military uh, uh, uniform cap, I would imagine. I didn't find a good example of it. it wasn't anything I could put glasses on. So uh, on the ascent, they left Camp Mir early in the morning, and uh, most of the party got to the summit at 1145, uh, except Piper, uh, who gave out he was exhausted and was about an hour, was about an hour late. Now, Van Trump is, uh, has said that uh, uh, I was much pleased by Mir's kindly sympathy for the lad and with his cheering and encouraging weir words as he urged the weir wearied climber to push on to the goal. He meanwhile waiting for it. So the party here, there were seven that made the summit. Uh, uh, on the left is uh, Dan Bass, who later on was uh, assistant manager of the Fry Hotel. With the Alpenstock there is uh, Van Trump. Mir is seated in the snow. Uh, Booth is uh, uh, next to him. And then with his hat off, not surprisingly, is Major Ingram. And Piper is still making his way up the mountain. Warner, of course, behind the camera. You know, a lot of credit has to go to Warner. I mean, he was not that much of a outdoorsman at the time, and his camera equipment weighed about uh, 50 pounds, camera and, and tripod and glass, probably glass negatives, although he did have some, some film, uh, film uh, plates with him. Now, the descent was no piece of cake for, uh, for uh, a Piper either. Uh, during the descent, he nearly lost his life. Uh, Piper and Muir had crossed, uh, everybody except Piper and Muir had crossed an ice bridge over a crevasse. And then the expedition photographer, Warner, heard a cry that made his very, very blood in his veins turn cold. This time, Piper had stepped into the middle of a snow bridge and had given away with him. He had thrown himself forward and, and caught the other side. You know, later in a presentation to the Mountaineers in 1915, you know, Piper said, my alpenstock and the whole ice bridge fell into the crevasse. I have often wondered uh, what would have happened if I had attempted to go across the bridge the ordinary way. So they did make it back uh, on the 14th, later in the day. Interesting, despite, you know, despite all of all of what he went through on the 14th, uh, Piper managed to collect an additional 11 specimens before they got back to the camp of the clouds. Now on page 93 of, of uh, Mountain Fever, Haynes, Haynes makes this statement. He says, on the 16th, the party began to break up. Ingram, Piper, and Booth passed around the east side of the mountain across the Cowitz and White River glaciers to the Bailey Willis Trail, which they followed to Wilkinson. When I read that, my first response was, really? In 1888, uh, did they really do that? Uh, I mean, they left Camp of the Clouds. Uh, they crossed uh, they crossed the Muir Snowfield, probably, the Cowitz Glacier. Then the Ingram Glacier, which was later, was later named, you know, for Ingram. The Whitman Glacier, Flying Plank Glacier, Emmons Glacier, Winthrop Glacier, Carbon Glacier, and maybe part of the Russell Glacier. I mean, that's a nice piece of mountaineering. It's odd that it's never really been documented uh, anywhere else. In fact, there's, there's kind of an alternative to this, which I can't get into. But I can think of, you know, several reasons why Piper wouldn't want to have done this. Uh, first of all, you know, he had to be tired. I mean, he was exhausted from the climb. He had a harrowing experience coming down, only one day to rest. At this point, he had at least 76 specimens that we know of, uh, and you would think he would be anxious to get those, you know, back home and, and start the mounting process. Plus, he was still with, uh, he was still in the company of, of John Muir, you know, I think, you know, the great man, and he would have continued to learn and, and, uh, and learn from him. My sense is that Ingram, uh, who's 36 at the time, truly had mountain fever. I mean, this was the first of 13 summits uh, uh, that Ingram uh, had made. 
Uh, and so I think he probably talked these two young guys uh, to going around the mountain with them. Uh, I'm going to do a little more research on this because I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by it. And, uh, you know, maybe stay tuned. But presumably, if he did this, this went with him. Uh, I wish this was a sharper photo. Uh, maybe there's a way to get one. Piper went on to do some incredible things. I mean, he did get a master's degree from uh, the Washington Territorial University. He went over to Pullman in 1893 and became the professor of botany and zoology at Washington Agricultural College. He was there, I think, for 11 years. And he was a great help uh, to, to field botanists like uh, Suxdorf, uh, Kusick. Uh, Asa Gray was gone at this point. And he became, as a younger guy even, he became, I think, kind of a great help and mentor you know, to those field uh, botanists. Went to Harvard in 1900, and then he went to work for the Department of Agriculture, where he had a very storied career. A very serious guy, did a lot of great things, did a lot of traveling. Uh, and there's a lot to say about his work with uh, soybeans, foliage, uh, crops, uh, a number, you know, a number of things, turf grass for golf courses. He was always very interested in the practical and commercial side. Not to make the story any longer than we need to, but just to finish it up with a statement after his death by his old partner at what I would call WSU, uh, R. Kent Beatty said, we who knew Charles Vancouver Piper recognize his manifold interests, his breadth of training and vision, his ability to grasp the fundamentals of a problem, and his practical insight into botanical and organ, organ, ergonomic problems. Those who knew him in his later years only remember him chiefly for his brilliant leadership in the ergonomic field. But Professor Piper's old friends think of him as a naturalist, especially as a botanical explorer and pioneer. Aptly was he named Vancouver. What George Vancouver did for the geography of, the, of Puget Sound and the Pacific Northwest and more, Piper did for botany. Now here's a taxonomic uh, quiz of the day. If Lewis and Clark collected this in, in the Lolo in 1806, and Piper at 21 years old was running around Mount Rainier in 1888, why is it called Piper's an enemy? Yeah, we probably should. Now let's look at Rainier's other anemones. Uh, the two on the right are lower elevation uh, plants. The Layal's an enemy, which uh, is pretty scarce, be hard to find, and it also has this, uh, this sort of purple form. The three-leafed anemone is quite common. Uh, if you're interested in seeing that, a great place to see it is on the West Side Road in the Squally entrance and on the west side of the West Side Road. Uh, I took this, I think, last year, and I was kind of surprised because you don't see it kind of on its own like this as a nice profile. I don't realize the plant was this tall, it's usually in with a lot of other plants and foliage. And here, of course, is the, the three leaves. Nicely shown. Higher elevation uh, plants include Drummond's anemone, which is, is, is common. Quite showy, uh, more sepals, similar in structure to the Occidentalist. And since we're going to be talking about the life cycle uh, of plants, you know, here's, here's that same plant, you know, in its late stage. And it doesn't have uh, plumous uh, fruit. This is more what you would expect to see there. It can be a fairly uh, showy plant. This was taken over on uh, Mount Fremont. The other high elevation plant is the globe anemone, not to be confused with the globe flower. This is pretty, uh, pretty rare. You're not likely to see this very often. Anemones are part of the buttercup family. These are other family members we can expect to see in, uh, in Mount Rainier, marigolds. And one of the properties of anemones is they are toxic. Uh, they contain the 
uh, Roto and Enamin. It's not highly toxic. Uh, I tried to rub my hands, crush some, crush some leaves and see if I could get a rash and it did not much happen, but it's probably toxic enough, you know, so it keeps grazing animals uh, from, from eating it. So one of, a, of seven reasons why this plant is so prolific, uh, I'll start with, you know, this is, that's the first one. At higher elevations in the subalpine zone, uh, you'll see these plants, the monk's hood, is highly toxic and that, that does need that does need to be avoided. Now, coming soon, uh, we have uh, the western anemone or pos flower. It, it comes when the snow melts. Uh, it's, it's not something that blooms in, in April and is gone in May. Uh, you could see this uh, well into the season. In, in this last edition of the Alpine Flowers of Mount Rainier Guide, we did include a short discussion of the life cycle of the, life cycle of the palace flower. I'm kind of glad we did this because, I mean, a lot of people are really curious uh, about this plant. I mean, it, it's, um, uh, it's very interesting. And I was uh, having lunch on the top of Deggy Peak uh, in the Sourdough Ridge, and one of the volunteer rangers was sitting there, and he knew I was taking pictures of this, and he said, well, where does this come from? I mean, not many people know that the mop head comes from, you know, that, that beautiful uh, creamy bowl-shaped flower. So what we're going to look at is the phenology of the life cycle of the plants. Uh, these definitions come from the UW Department of uh, Biology, budding, flowering, usually the showiest part of the plant that holds the reproductive parts, stamens and pistils, ripening fruit, and releasing seed. So we will be looking at these phenophases. But what I got interested in as I did this was, was really looking at the phase transitions, uh, where you go from bud to flower, flower to fruit, and then the seed dispersal. And I think the real interesting photographic opportunities came at, you know, during, during these, these transitions. So the first transition is the bud turns into a flower and opens. The reproductive parts become visible and available for pollination. So what we'll see, right, right next to melting snow, you'll see little sprouts, you know, popping up either, you know, right through the snow in some cases or right next to it. And they have this uh, downy uh, covering. Uh, I suspect, you know, some people, you know, might suggest that that's kind of a, uh, insulation for the new plant since it's so close to the snow and the ice. And they maintain that, that really fuzzy coat all along. And then we're finally open for business where we can see the stamens and the pistils apparent. So, when we go to bloom, you'll see hillsides similar to this, uh, grassy hillsides. This is at Mazama Ridge, which is directly east of Paradise. What's interesting about this is the date, uh, August 26, 2011. We're getting real close to fall in the mountains at the end of, uh, at the end of August. But here they are, you know, just really coming up and, and blooming. This was interesting because this was not a record snowfall, but the 2010-11 snowfall was uh, 107 inches, or 41% above average. The plant, um, nice to see it kind of isolated and not growing in the cluster. The stems are, you know, 10 to 60 centimeters tall. Uh, the flowers are solitary, you know, atop that stem, three to seven centimeters across. Uh, I read somewhere that they're heliotropic, or they turn toward the sun, and I'm not quite sure where I got this. This plant on, on the right, you know, sort of suggests that it might be doing that, but I don't think that's really the case. So uh, I, haven't, I haven't really verified that it does, in fact, turn toward the sun. Uh, it has uh, six, usually five to eight sepals, 
Uh, most of the ones in, in Rainier uh, are six. And if you look underneath the plant, you'll see this blue tinge and you say, hey mom, no calyx. Well, you're actually looking, you're actually looking at the calyx at this point because it's an uh, incomplete flower. So when one of the four whorls of a complete plant is gone, it's, it's, it's said to be incomplete, which is the case here. So what looks like petals without the sepals, you know, actually become the sepals. So what we're looking at are, are sepals, not petals. But we're gonna talk a lot about the styles. So the Harris definition here is a usually narrow portion of the pistil connecting the stamen and the ovary. Lots of stamens, probably 150 uh, stamens. Uh, uh, the male part of the reproductive system with the golden anthers. And they are fly pollinated. So the second reason they're so prolific was the fact that, you know, they, they really can, they really can uh, come to life. They can really uh, sprout during the entire summer season next to snowbanks. So they don't have a real tight uh, 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 season. Uh, the third reason is they have a very robust uh, pollinator uh, with the hoverflies. Now these are also known as flower flies. Uh, they're friends of the garden, if you can distinguish them. At first, you know, they kind of look like uh, uh, bees, or not bees, but what I'm trying to say. Uh, or, uh, uh, and, but, they, but they're not. They're, uh, uh, they don't have a stinger, so there's no bite. And, and they hover, and bees, bees don't hover. Yellow jackets is what I'm trying to say. It might look like a yellow jacket, but they aren't, and they're not even a typical fly. By the way, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Piper had hundreds of plants that he named and hundreds of things that were named after him, including a whole genus of orchids with eight species in them, but also two flies. Two flies uh, carry the name Piperi uh, because of his work in insects. We included a little discussion of pollination by flies in the guide. Uh, David wrote this, that many people are surprised to learn that the floss flower is fly pollinated. You'd think that a beautiful flower would be pollinated by a, butter, a butterfly or a bee. But there are others that are also pollinated by flies. And uh, flies are active in lower air temperatures near snow fields where floss flowers and several other wildflowers occur. Low air temperatures present challenges to bees and butterflies because the relatively larger flight muscles need higher temperatures to work. But look for bees and butterflies basking their dark bodies in the sun while flies are zipping around nearby. I would estimate that the pos flower stays in this flower condition for a relatively short time. I mean, as soon as the pollination, as soon as the pollination is, is complete, uh, I think it's ready to move to the, to the next stage, maybe as short as I'm just gonna make up my own guess here, is it maybe a couple weeks. So it may only be in flower for a couple weeks, uh, whereas it could be in fruit for a, a couple months. So the next transition is we're gonna move from flower to fruit. The stems will increase up to two times in height. The receptacle elongates, uh, the sepals shed, the stamens droop, and the styles now form feathery tails, and those tails reflex to form the plumage or the, uh, or the mop head. I want to take a, a few minutes uh, with this photo. Uh, since this is a photographic study, Thought we might talk a little bit about photographs as well. Uh, this, th this is one of my favorite pictures and I think probably one of the best flower photographs I've ever taken. Now a lot of people might not see very much you know in it and 
I show it to a few people and they kind of, you know, yeah, it's nice. But so you have to be prepared, you know, as a photographer that some things um, are, you know, are only going to be uh, uh, only going to be for yourself. This captures, in my opinion, the transition extremely well. Uh, first of all, you see the you see the uh, uh, the carpels extending into their flowery phase, but at the tips, you still have the stigma. So the stigmas are still part uh, part of this pistil. So and, and you won't see that for much longer. The photo is sharp where it needs to be sharp. You know the stamens are shown, uh, the sepal is shown. Uh, and it's most of the by the time you get to this point, most of the sepals have turned brown. And this was kind of interesting because there was one white sepal left. I didn't pick the others off. And this this is how I found it. Uh, the other thing I like about this photo is it's got an interesting background, a blurred background. Uh, and it's also split. It isn't solid. It's got a lighter, lighter background, you know, down toward, you know, toward the bottom. You get a blurred background. Uh, one of two ways. It's either setting your aperture to, to a more open aperture, you know, an f2.8 or f4 versus an f16 where you get more depth of field. So you're not looking for depth of field. The other way you get it is the background is just a long ways away. And I think that was the case here. You know, there was uh, uh, some fir trees or, or whatever on the other side of the trail a ways off. So we start to see this uh, plumage uh, grow. Uh, it extends upward until it eventually reflexes. Stamens hang around. Sepals start to drop off. I like this one a lot. Uh, you still see the, the fuzzy uh, fuzziness on the uh, sepals, even though they're, they're just about done. And the uh, styles uh, are just about ready to reflex. It's an example of a couple different stages of this. And then finally, they all mature, they pop up and say, here we are. This meadow is on the uh, Natchez Loop Trail, on, on the uh, Pacific Crest Trail portion. So on the south side of the mountain, the meadows will be fairly diverse. So it'll, it'll be part of a, a vast, a variety of, of, uh, of flowers and what we call lush herbaceous uh, meadows. Grassy hillside, looking towards the Tatouches, the castle, Pinnacle Peak and Plummer Peak off in the distance. Reaches up and competes with the other higher flowers in the meadow at this at this stage. The raised lovage in the center distorts. And interestingly, uh, on its own in very harsh conditions, uh, almost like sentinels along the trail. In this case, the Bay, uh, Paradise Glacier Trail. So the next reason why, you know, I think they're, they're so prolific is because uh, they're the habitat diversity, they can grow in, in a variety of different conditions, lush herbaceous meadows, like on the south side of Rainier, bright grass meadows around sunrise where we'll spend most of our time now, and also in glacial uh, rains, very, very poor soils. So, uh, where it's sunrise, bright grass meadow.
these plants make an interesting backlit subject because of the translucent nature of, of, the, uh, of the styles of the feathery tails. Uh, this was, as you can see, was taken fairly early. Uh, well, the, the image, the, the sun, uh, this is referred to as a F-16 star. So if you can set your aperture on your camera to F-16, you should get this sort of image for your sun. You'll see this used in, in movies a lot of times too. They'll, they'll set motion picture cameras at F-16 F in order to get a star on the picture. Now you might be getting a star even though you're not in aperture mode setting your own f-stop because your your camera because you're pointing into a very bright situation your camera may be stopping this down in a way where it's actually going to close to an f-16 stop so they make interesting backlit subjects the dark area it, you can see the receptacle is now extended into this long, oblong shape. And while they have this sort of disheveled sort of appearances, is if you look at them from this angle, you'll see that they have amazing uh, radial uh, symmetry, you know, around the receptacle. Uh, and this is taken in the mist in the morning. I like to get, I like to collect old guidebooks, and you know a lot of times there will be in more than one um, there will be a section on how to photograph you know how to photograph uh, wildflowers, and they will they will suggest uh, bringing a mister uh, along and then occasionally misting you know your subject so you get kind of a special effect. Uh, I've never used I've never used a mister, so this is uh, this is actual. Uh, do on this anemone. To use a mister, that's okay, I guess. Uh, on the sunrise side, you see large clusters of, of the plant. I think there's 23 in this, and it almost looks like one plant with a lot of flower heads on it, but they're individual plants, and it's very difficult to Get a good sense for what the leaf structure is. And I think a photographic study needs to have details which include you know, a very detailed look at the leaf structure. So one way for us to do this is to go back and look at Pam Camp's specimen, which does a very nice job of displaying the leaves. And here's some descriptions from Polger and McKinnon, Alpine Plants of the Northwest. So the stem leaves, usually three in the world, short stocked and the basal leaves are, are longer and they're dissected into narrow segments. It's a stem leaf. That's kind of about the probably the best you can do without disturbing it. What I'll do sometimes is I carry one of these write and rain notebooks and I'll take a leaf specimen uh, and then just press it you know, in the notebook. This is quarter inch line spacing, so you get an idea, idea of the scale. And pinnate by Harris is resembling a feather, as in a compound leaf with leafless arranged on opposite sides. Now, barring any major interventions, we're ready to move to the next the next phase. And this is where the mop heads lose their, lose their seeds. They're ripe, they ripen, they become green to plum colored. Not, only, not always really plum colored, um, but they become light sometimes. The receptacle is revealed, and then ultimately the receptacle is bare and the dispersal is uh, complete. Let's take a closer look at, at the seeds themselves. So they're, the seeds are acenes, uh, which are uh, indehiscent. They don't open. Uh, the fruit is with a single seed. And the seed stays attached to the ovary wall at a single point. You can also see the, uh, the beaks of the seeds. 
and the receptacle is the portion of the pedestal, which is this single stalk, which is right there, uh, of a flower upon which the flower parts are born. All the flower parts, including, as you can see, the, the stamens here. Fall comes early uh, in, the, uh, in the mountains. And wind dispersal is another reason why these plants are, I think, are so prolific. They begin to begin to lose their feathery tails, take to the wind like sails. Now, I waited a long time for this photograph. No, actually, uh, the way I did this, this is not Photoshop. Uh, the way I did this was I, I set my camera up on a tripod with uh, continuous shooting, had a cable release or an automatic control. And then I got off to the side of the plant and blew like crazy. And, and then I was holding my shutter release button down the whole time, not knowing whether I got anything until I got it home and on the computer. Dick Olmsted, we were talking about the role of photography. Photography, he said, well, one thing he said photography can't record is, you know, wind dispersal of seeds. I said, oh, really? And then I sent him this. And uh, you can see the, uh, this looks, this to me, it looks kind of like a fish fillet, you know, where the, the feathery tail consists of the feathers on, on the opposite side not radiating around, but sort of on the opposite side. Stamens, uh, the stamens stay around forever. I have a dried one of these right here that I'm looking at with nothing on the receptacle, but, but the stamens still there. Another backlit example. Be a little bit careful when you do these, when you look through your lens that you aren't frying your eyes, you know, as you kind of get the sun directly behind them. Makes a nice backlit subject, I think. I don't know why I like this picture. This, I guess in part because this, this is sort of, uh, this would be widely neglected. You'd walk right by this and say, well, look at these old plants, you know. And I think it's kind of interesting. Lots of seeds is my sixth reason why I think these are so prolific. Uh, this is 635 seeds from this one receptacle. I know that because I counted them. Uh, we created this little composition in a, one of these studio light boxes, which are a lot of fun you know, to kind of play with. We could do some interesting things. Lots and lots of seeds. Now we're really entering that final phase. You can see the basil. The basil leaves have all uh, sloughed off. Stem leaves are still there. And things are pretty much done. Uh, this is an example, I think, where it's really important in wildflower photography to get low and get low and then get lower. Because this picture wouldn't be nearly as interesting, I don't think, if the camera angle didn't have those receptacles, you know, uh, with the sky behind them. Some of the seeds just fall right into the, uh, to the old leaves. Pointing towards the sky. Uh, one comment on, on, on this kind of a, this is kind of a challenging picture in a way because it's so easy when you have the sky as a background, which is infinity, the automatic focus wants to go to infinity. So unless you're really careful about getting one of these in focus, if you're using uh, autofocus, you might also focus down uh, toward the ground at the same focal plane, like those leaves at the bottom, lock your focus there and then reposition your lens to get the, uh, uh, to get the receptacles. 
In here, the receptacles are by and large gone. The last reason why I think these plants are so prolific is they just simply have a sunny disposition. Uh, quick comment on this and we're done. Just what is a photographic plant study? And I think it should contain, you know, these components and these images. I think we, we should try to document the phonology. We should show the pollinators. And we really need to show the morphology to the point where we're clearly showing the reproductive parts and leaves definitely. And then image the features that we really need to show in order to identify them, especially rare species or uncommon ones. We will never, uh, field imaging will never probably replace, you know, collections, but we can, we can add to that uh, we can add to that science, I think. Lastly, my grandkids would like to say hi. And here's some thank yous. David, of course, I wouldn't be doing this without David. Always like to put a shout out to David Beek, who did the floor of Mount Rainier, the Volunteer Rangers, Native Plant Society, which has been a great audience for me. Appreciate it very much. My wife, Linda, that gets me there and back. Uh, that's my website on top. Uh, if you're interested in getting the Alpine Flowers on Mount Rainier Guide, the only way you can get that currently online is to go to Discover Your Northwest and buy it there. Uh, there it is available at a number of retail outlets, uh, especially those in and around the park. Burke Museum has it, uh, and there are a few other places. But if you're having trouble, if you, like, if you want, would like to obtain a copy and you're having trouble, finding it, send me an email and I'll, I'll figure something out for you. So, but that, that's about it. And I want to thank you and I look forward to any, you know, any questions you might have. Let's see, we've got a question here, Donovan. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, the best month, Ken Stone asked, the best month in elevation to view the mop head just prior to seed release stage. Okay, that's a good question. I should have mentioned that. The range, uh, when I showed the range, the distribution map, you see it, the range of uh, mop heads is primarily in the subalpine zone. So probably around uh, 5,000 to 7,000 feet. Uh, same would go true for the Olympics, as well as the Cascades. Uh, the plant in flower can be seen where there's no snow, where the snow may be just receding. So that could be in, if you're up at five, if you're at uh, Paradise at 5,400 feet and the snow banks are starting to melt back, then you'll see sprouts coming up right at the edge of the snow bank. And so it'll be a week or two and then you'll get, you know, full sized, uh, full sized flower. Thank you for that question. Another question from Cherry and Jim Pedrick is do they grow taller as they go to seed? Yes, uh, as I mentioned, they, they, uh, as they go to seed, they will increase in height by about twice. So they'll, they'll get about, they'll get twice as, twice as tall. When they're in flower, they're really, they can be kind of tucked down in the, in the meadow, not much higher than lupin or other meadow flowers, you know, six inches, maybe eight inches, uh, 10 possibly. But then when they go to seed, I mean, these flowers can get, you saw that, the example of, uh, of Piper's collection uh, was much, much taller than the herbarium sheet, which is uh, 16 and a half inches. So they'll get up to 20 inches, maybe even two feet in height uh, in seed, for sure. Very dominant, and become very dominant, you know, with the, uh, with the mop head. And a comment from Kathleen Glassman. She thinks that the plant in your garden is the Pulsatilla vulgaris. Vulgaris? Wow. Yeah. Well, that's going to be on the comment page so I can see it. I think it should be. It's in the chat. Yeah, okay, great. It's in the chat. Thank you very much. And uh, that, that plant's been a lot of fun. I mean, uh, when it goes to seed, 
uh, you can cut those uh, seed heads and stems and they will dry uh, and they make really interesting, uh, really interesting dried plants. Okay, well, I think that's the end of the questions uh, and comments. So, except that people were saying exquisite photography and how much they enjoyed learning more about the moth heads. Yeah, and you know, that's one thing I'd like to also say is that, you know, I was really impressed by Sarah Gage's presentation on plant identification. And, you know, she talked about, you know, strategies to, to learn and, and learn how to observe. And I've gotten really kind of more and more interested in kind of thinking about and you know, what the pow powers of observation and, and our, you know, our abilities to notice and pay close attention to things. And, and I think photography helps us, you know, do that. I mean, we, we consciously go through a process of, of what we're looking at, how we're looking at, where to find things. The other thing she said in her, in her comment on strategies was to get to know the people. And for some reason, it's been easy for me to get uh, interested in uh, our Northwest explorers and early botanists. Uh, and I think the story of Piper, which I just told a, just a capsule of is, is, uh, is interesting. And of course there are, you know, there are, are many others. So I encourage you to let your mind wander in those directions as well.